All right, everybody. This is Jim Brewer. Uh, welcome to this WebEx that's going to talk briefly about the NeuroQuant assessment of cognitive impairment. And uh, what we're trying to do as a company here is to uh, try to improve the diagnosis of neurodegenerative disease by incorporating biomarkers to give a, um, an additional objective assessment of what's going on in the brain. And we feel strongly that uh, there's a component of the radiological read that's typically missing uh, when a neurologist or other specialist gets a report back from radiology uh, that mainly focuses on lesions and does not uh, focus on uh, neurodegeneration, which is an important component of the patient population that we see, particularly with um, elderly patients who are coming in with cognitive impairment one of the first branch points of our decision tree is to say whether we think this is a worried well patient or do we feel like this is a true uh, cognitive impairment that may be due to neurodegeneration, and further, whether we think that that uh, a case is going to move on to dementia or whether we think we might be able to improve their uh, clinical course. So with that, I'll just move to the first slide, and that's kind of the idea here is to move beyond just lesion detection. That is, uh, quantitative imaging is a major uh, force in the field of, uh, uh, of radiology. That, that's the way that the field seems to be moving to get more objective assessment of the images. And so for quantitative imaging, it essentially means that we'd be extracting quantitative in addition to pathological information from images. Uh, this would be helpful not only for the radiologist's interpretation, but also for direct use by the referring physician. There are examples of this in clinical practice, with uh, echocardiogram being uh, a very important uh, a quantitative imaging marker of cardiac function. That is, when we send a patient off for uh, echocardiogram, we don't want just to know what is uh, the structure of the heart and whether there are lesions on the heart, we actually want to get a measurement of the ejection from the left ventricle and actually get an ejection fraction. In fact, we'd be quite upset as a referring physician if they didn't give us that trackable number that we can watch over time and, uh, and objectively compare to their prior uh, visit. We also can do this with uh, PET scanning with regional hypometabolism or ligand binding. And certainly an MRI, certain, uh, quantitative imaging in the current uh, practice would be something like give us the number and volume of tumors or lesions, uh, but really the approach that we're focusing on today is to quantify the regional atrophy of important structures. And why is this important? Some people might say, well, gee, you know, neurodegenerative disease such as Alzheimer's disease, there's no treatment, so why are you making a more accurate diagnosis? Uh, that is... Uh, uh, not true that there's no management of, of uh, neurodegenerative illnesses. It's true that we don't have a drug that actually stops the progression of the disease, but it is uh, not true that we don't uh, benefit as a clinician from having a more accurate diagnosis of whether the patient is going to remain stable over time or whether they seem to have a neurodegenerative illness. In fact, there's many mimics of Alzheimer's disease in the early stages, of course, normal aging is uh, a component of uh, aging, uh, and, and memory loss occurs with normal aging. Medications can certainly cause memory loss, alcohol, depression, anxiety, sleep problems, and any number of uh, non-neurodegenerative illnesses. And uh, in these cases, they're almost all treatable causes. So it's very important to be able to assess and say whether your patient has one of these mimics of the neurodegenerative illness. On the other side, of course, the looking exactly the same clinically in the early stages would be things that are uh, very severe, such as Alzheimer's disease or other neurodegenerative disorders. And in those cases, in the early stages, they'll look just like a treatable cause with the first cognitive complaints being memory, um, just like what you see in just uh, the normal stages of aging or mild medication effect. But in fact, if you look in the brain, you'll see extensive neurodegeneration underlying that, particularly focused on the hippocampus. So a nice branch point is to say, well, this patient truly does have a cognitive impairment. Is it due to neurodegeneration or not? And we feel strongly that quantifications using neuroquant can help that assessment. 
So look at this image here, which shows clear um, abnormality of a brain image. Uh, it shows on the uh, right side of the image, but the left side of the patient's brain, clear atrophy of the temporal lobe and expansion of the temporal horn and loss of the hippocampal volume. And the nice thing about uh, uh, this image is that it clearly has the other side, which is normal to compare it to. And uh, so that would allow, even without quantification, a physician to say, hey, there's something abnormal here. Even though there's no tumor, stroke, or bleed, I don't think this is a normal scan. Um, but what I always say about this one is, well, that's pretty severe atrophy. And so what about when this was five years prior to this, when this patient first started having their cognitive impairment, would the radiologist have picked that up? And uh, um, how about if it were a symmetric atrophy, as we typically see in things like Alzheimer's disease? So this was a low bar degeneration, uh, clearly detectable just with standard imaging, but we feel strongly that quantitative imaging with something like NeuroQuant, where you could uh, relate the measures to normative database, or uh, show an asymmetry score on this patient would be a, a clear case where you would uh, benefit and get an earlier and more accurate diagnosis of that case. In Alzheimer's disease, the atrophy is quite symmetric. So as you can see in this slide, we've known for a very long time that the hippocampus is a sensitive structure to the atrophy of Alzheimer's disease, and it occurs extremely early in the illness. Uh, it occurs probably five years before the first complaints start to uh, uh, arise. And so by the time a patient presents to your clinic with an actual memory complaint, if it's due to Alzheimer's disease, you'll see the atrophy within the hippocampus. Uh, that can be more subtle than what we see here, which is a clearly severe loss of the hippocampus on the right side with expansion of the fluid-filled space as depicted by the arrow of the uh, temporal horn of the lateral ventricle or the inferior lateral ventricle. On the left side is a control subject of the same age who does not have Alzheimer's disease, and you can see clearly that the hippocampus is spared and the temporal horn is appropriately small. Being able to quantify this as was uh, known to be an important and useful biomarker even 20 years ago, but the uh, specifics of getting it into clinical practice was a challenge because it required you to go through and hand draw out the hippocampus on every single slice, uh, which of course is not practical in everyday clinical practice. So with the uh, tool of NeuroQuant, which allows a fully automated segmentation of the brain images into their component structures, this now becomes possible in clinical practice to be able to use the biomarker of volumetric MRI in clinical practice. And this, uh, importantly, has gone through FDA regulate, regulatory approval to demonstrate uh, equivalence with expert manual segmentation of these structures, of all these structures of the brain, even though we focus quite a bit on the hippocampus. So <laughs> on the left side, you see a fully automated neuroquant with a large yellow structure of the hippocampus. Uh, on the right side, you see an Alzheimer's patient with a shriveled, small, pea-sized hippocampus and expanded temporal horn. Uh, how this allows us to improve the diagnosis and not wait until the stage of dementia before we make an accurate diagnosis, we in clinical practice tend to see these patients very early in their, uh, in their impairment. They come to our clinic saying, Doc, I'm really concerned about my memory problems. My mom had Alzheimer's disease. I, uh, misplaced my keys, I've parked my car in the wrong spot uh, and couldn't find the spot where I parked it. Well, we say that's very <coughs> typical for an elderly patient to have those things. It's even typical for a young patient to sometimes lose their keys or forget where they parked their car. The problem is when this arises uh, to a true cognitive concern that is confirmed by objective, uh, just cognitive testing, even bedside testing, and you find Indeed, this is more than just a worry. This is a true problem, and it needs to be worked up. At that stage, we call it mild cognitive impairment. That is, they have a clear objective memory problem that is confirmed by their informant, that is, their spouse or other uh, person who knows them and says, indeed, there's a problem. At that point, we still don't know whether that's due to Alzheimer's disease or due to other mimics that may be curable. <laughs> and it would be very valuable to have some way to look in the brain 
to say to get a better prediction of whether they're going on to any one of these three outcomes. What we argue is that instead of just using the clinical picture, you could add imaging, and in fact the AAN criteria argues that at this stage imaging of the brain is appropriate to rule out a structural etiology, but if you're getting a brain image, we feel that one should go ahead and go further and not just look rule out tumor strokes or bleeds as the cause of cognitive impairment, but also use quantitative imaging to assess the imaging phenotype of this mild cognitive impairment patient. If that MCI imaging phenotype shows atrophy in the typical way that an Alzheimer's patient shows atrophy, then it's very likely, and we have tons of data to support this and years and years of published data to suggest that in the setting of hippocampal atrophy at the, st at the stage of mild cognitive impairment, uh, they're much more likely to go on to convert to a severe uh, uh, dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease. On the other hand, even with the exact same clinical picture, that is mild cognitive impairment and an objective loss of memory, uh, if their MCI imaging phenotype, that is an assessment of the brain structure, shows minimal atrophy of the hippocampus, there's lots and lots of data to suggest uh, that they're going to have a more benign course and may actually have a curable mimic of Alzheimer's disease. Of course, it does not guarantee that they won't go on to Alzheimer's disease. That will be just an additional component to your clinician's assessment to take all these data points and make your best assessment, but clearly the lack of atrophy makes you think twice about the possibility that Alzheimer's disease is the uh, cause of this person's cognitive impairment. And therefore, if uh, you, if you see that, you may actually be drawn towards more, towards redoubling your efforts to find a curable etiology. Uh, we're also assessing uh, quantitative imaging and neuroquant to assess whether we might be able to pick up other dementias and distinguish them from Alzheimer's disease, and that's uh, something for an, another talk. What I wanted to show you here is just an example of the segmentation that occurs in a fully automated fashion. It's just taking a 3D T1 uh, weighted image using the ADNI protocol, uh, the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, develop a um, set of imaging parameters that allows standardization across different scanners and allows you to get very high gray-white contrast and allows a fully automated segmentation of the brain. And when, since you can do this in a fully automated fashion, uh, across hundreds and hundreds of individuals who have been cognitively characterized, you can build a normative database that, uh, that provides you with uh, a measurement of where this patient that you're evaluating falls relative to their peers. So uh, the age and sex-adjusted normative database and also adjusted for intracranial volume allows you to say, almost like a blood test, whether this hippocampus falls within normal limits or is it two standard deviations below the mean expected for their age or five standard deviations below the mean expected for their age. Similarly, and I think very importantly, it doesn't just focus on the hippocampus because some people, in fact, 5% of uh, individuals who are normal will have a hippocampal volume that's less than five-fifth percentile. Uh, so one needs an ancillary measure such as the temporal horn to show that there's ex vacuo dilatation suggesting that this is not just a congenitally small hippocampus, but actually the temporal horn has expanded. Uh, also, it's valuable to measure the lateral ventricles. That gives you a, uh, at least a window into the overall global atrophy that you may see in the patient and the overall state of the ventricles. Uh, so uh, if there's global ventricular expansion, then the temporal horn might be expanded even without atrophy, and we'll go into some cases that will describe that. So if you present the volumes as a, as a percentile of their normative uh, database, uh, that allows the clinician to get an easy read onto where this patient falls relative to their peers, and it just gives another important data point in their, in their clinical assessment of this uh, individual. So in this example report, what we see here is, of course, the demographic data at the top. Uh, the middle section shows uh, the images themselves, which I think is a very important addition to the report because a lot of clinicians uh, sitting in their uh, office are a little bit 
sometimes frustrated to have to log into the PACS in order to view just an example image of the brain. So the NeuroQuant report itself brings in the uh, example images so the clinician can have that at their fingertips. The next section down is the table showing the hippocampal, uh, lateral ventricle, and inferior lateral ventricle volume, uh, and then also presents it as a percentage of the intracranial volume and also as a percentile of their uh, peer group. So that is their age and sex um, uh, for this uh, database here. So on the bottom you can see the normogram almost like the head circumference and growth charts that we do for pediatric neurology. Uh, you can see now at the later stages of age, um, you can see where this individual's brain structures fall relative to uh, their peers. And this has been extended back to age 20 and will probably go much further even back because there have been requests uh, such as by the Department of Defense that wanted to look at this for uh, other um, uh, sources of neurodegeneration, and particularly epilepsy, but also potentially traumatic brain injury. Uh, but right now we're focusing on the neurodegeneration here that occurs with neurodegenerative illnesses such as Alzheimer's disease. You can see the workflow is very simple. This works right into the, uh, uh, the radiologist and clinician's workflow because uh, directly from the MRI scanner, these scans can be uh, routed to the PACS node that processes uh, the images. So it's an automated processing. There's nothing that needs to come off of the PAC system. It's just a right click of the 3D T1 series and say send it to this PACS node. Five minutes later, it will come back uh, fully segmented and the reports will be generated. Uh, so those generated in our center, those, uh, those generated reports are uh, available in PDF form so one can encrypt it using the standard PDF encryption software and even email them in that case once they're password encrypted. Um, but there are many different uh, approaches one can do to work to put this into your workflow. Some individuals have just dictated the numbers into their uh, reports. Um, uh, so that's the, that's the workflow and the report. And let's look at a couple of cases here. So in this case, you see very clearly a coronal image of an elderly patient's brain. Uh, and already you see clearly see the severe atrophy in the medial temporal lobe and an almost complete loss of this anterior portion of the hippocampus and a very extensive thinning of the entorhinal cortex. So this is clearly, if this patient is coming in with a memory complaint, I think I've got the reason uh, why his memory complaint is uh, likely uh, a problem. It's, he's almost lost all of his hippocampus, at least in this slice area, and you can look back through the entire section of it uh, and it is a very small hippocampus. Uh, in this radiological read, uh, the report was very typical for what we get back. Uh, it's focused on lesions. They note that there's diffuse brain atrophy, but it's no within normal limits for age. Ventricles are normal in size and position. Cerebral hemispheres, deep nuclei, and brainstem and cerebellum are unremarkable. No evidence of chronic blood products, acute infarct or mass lesion, and normal flow voids and uh, then just to note that they actually were looking at this particular uh, brain image, they didn't say, yes, I see that he's had cataract surgery and the nasal sinuses are clear. Uh, but in general, when a clinician gets this report back, their impression is, well, there's nothing on the MRI scan of interest, when in fact there is a lot that's very important uh, in this read. Um, uh, I mean, in this scan, but not in this read. So the note is that the volume loss may be within normal limits for age. But in fact, if you look at the NeuroQuant report, you see, no, it's not at all within the normal limits of age. That was an educated guess by the radiologist, and to their you know, defense, it's hard to have in your head a clear normative database for every age range. And in fact, this patient was 89 years old, so hard to say how much hippocampus should be left normally for an 89-year-old individual, but we know that through having segmented individuals across the age bands. And you know that even if you're 89, a 5.41 cc hippocampus is very small for this individual's age, and you can see uh, in the images themselves that that hippocampus is just a mild, very minimal tissue left, and the temporal horn is quite expanded. The lateral ventricles are still right around two standard deviations, whereas the temporal horns themselves are almost four to five standard deviations out of the range of normal. Um, 
So the, uh, the basic way that one can work this into their uh, algorithm is available on a, a number of publications that we put out. One of them here is McAvoy and Brewer, uh, Imaging and Medicine 2012. We have other uh, references that you can see on the website. But this general idea, and of course medicine is never as easy as a decision tree, but uh, just to give a general framework for how to work these biomarkers into your clinical practice, is that, uh, you know, certainly with a patient with cognitive complaint, uh, we get a lot of those patients. And uh, uh, I don't think that one should necessarily uh, try biomarkers on every individual with a cognitive complaint. <laughs> I think that first your clinical assessment is something that one should do. And if you cannot confirm that they even have a true problem, that is, they're just a worried well, uh, in fact, they can leave that clinician's office with a very good feeling. That is, the doc says, I don't find anything wrong with me. Uh, so one can reassure and educate, monitor in that state. Uh, but if they do have a confirmed problem, that is, I, you know, I agree with you. <laughs> I agree with you that you have a problem with your memory. Now, the current state without biomarkers is to say, well, you have a problem with your memory, but it could be a lot of things. And uh, you try to uh, rule out some of the curable causes, and, and, uh, and if you don't find anything, you basically say, well, it's unclear, and we'll just have to watch and wait. Uh, but now with biomarkers, I think it's worthwhile to go forward and actually fully work up that person's cognitive complaint, and certainly imaging is part of that. And now with NeuroQuant, one can actually get an assessment uh, of not only about whether there's a structural lesion, but whether there's uh, objective support for a neurodegenerative etiology. And if there is a support for a neurodegenerative etiology, such as through the VMRI results, uh, one would really support the idea that this is a neurodegenerative etiology. Now, of course, we as clinicians always use uh, our tests to shape rather than uh, determine our diagnosis. So again, it's not as easy as a decision tree here, but just to put it here as uh, if there's atrophy shown in this uh, NeuroQuant report, it certainly does support your impression that this is the neurodegenerative cause. Uh, going further to use other biomarkers would be up, to, such as amyloid uh, CSF or PET imaging of amyloid, uh, is up to the clinician, but I think it should be reserved to this uh, set of patients who have a clear support for, an, for a cognitive uh, problem and a neurodegenerative etiology because otherwise you're going to be using these amyloid imaging uh, agents in uh, patients that may even be uh, having a mimic of Alzheimer's disease and it can throw you off. We could go through that as if there are any other questions about it, but I'll, I'm going to move on to interpretation of the NeuroQuant report. Uh, and one, I just want to lay out here one other uh, uh, clinical usage of NeuroQuant that's gaining a lot of uh, interest and, and usage across the country is in the assessment of asymmetry in epilepsy uh, because medial temporal lobe epilepsy, of course, uh, the most common uh, focal cause of epilepsy would be medial temporal uh, causes of epilepsy. And so we want to assess whether this patient may be um, a candidate for uh, medial temporal lobectomy as a cure for their uh, seizures. Well, in this case, you can see very clearly that this patient who had uh, clear support for uh, medial temporal lobe epilepsy, in fact, went on to get um, a, a hippocampal uh, resection or anterior temporal lobectomy of the uh, left side of his brain. You can see on the right side of the image and the left side of this patient's brain, he has a very small hippocampus. And one of the nice advantages of the, uh, of the NeuroQuant output is that no matter which way this patient's head is positioned in the scanner, the uh, output segmented images will be aligned to ATLAS, so you'll always be viewing the hippocampi uh, aligned up to one another. So that, I think, is a very valuable uh, component of what, what comes out of the processing stream. That is, one can always look at these hippocampi side by side when you're assessing volume. But the other advantage is that it does give you a measurement of the left and right hippocampus, and you can get an asymmetry score of that, and one of the uh, works that's in progress here is to generate actually a uh, normative database for each of the separate hippocampi, um, something we can talk about later. But let's just continue on the line of uh, Alzheimer's disease here and neurodegenerative illness. And what you see here is a case that shows uh, 
uh, one of the outcomes of a NeuroQuant report, which is uh, this patient's hippocampus is right at the mean expected for his age, right at the 56th percentile, uh, so smack dab in the middle of the normative range for a 72-year-old patient. And, uh, and also you go over to look for ex vacuo dilatation of that temporal horn and you find that there's no ex vacuo dilatation. So both, both the hippocampus and the temporal horn are quite normal in this case. And, uh, in fact, the lateral ventricle is also enlarged. So this is basically there's no uh, mm -hmm. objective support for neurodegenerative in, in, uh, etiology in this case. Uh, again, you'll use your clinical impression of all the other factors, but it certainly would make you think twice about calling this person an Alzheimer's patient. You'd have to say, well, it's pretty atypical for an Alzheimer's patient to have such a uh, spared uh, uh, uh case of no neurodegeneration. Of course, there's, there's non-limbic forms of neurodegeneration in Alzheimer's disease, sometimes seen in young uh, individuals, but, uh, but get, there's no support here objectively for a neurodegenerative cause here, um, and so it might redouble your efforts for a curable etiology. Here's another example of, a, of an outcome. This person has uh, a brain scan that you can see on the left side, uh, no ex vacuo dilatation of the temporal horn, and yet the hippocampus is out of the range of normal for this patient. So we look here and we see, oh, it's at the fifth percentile, so that's pretty small, or maybe less than first percentile even, uh, but you see no uh, additional support for uh, ex vacuo dilatation here, and so it may be that this patient's hippocampus was always this small. It might have always had a low volume, and we don't have um, the additional ancillary measure that says that this used to be a bigger hippocampus. So what we see here is a small hippocampus, but a normal temporal horn, a normal lateral ventricle, and so this is a low hippocampal volume without ex vacuo dilatation. It's possible that this is neurodegenerative cause, but it seems that the hippocampus may have always been that small, and you may want to follow that patient to see whether the trajectory of volume loss supports neurodegeneration or just that it was always a small hippocampus. Let's look at case three, which is more of a classic picture for early uh, me uh, memory loss in uh, Alzheimer's disease. You see a fairly spared uh, lateral ventricle, although somewhat large. This is at the 83rd percentile, um, but that can be within normal limits there. But when you look down at the hippocampus, you see clearly these are atrophied hippocampi and expanded temporal horn. Uh, I can also see right next to that the entorhinal cortex is quite thin in this case. But here what we see in the, um, in the volumetric report, a very small hippocampus, more than two standard deviations out of the range of normal, and that's also supported by the fact that the temporal horn is expanded, and so we see a low volume of the hippocampus, a large volume of the temporal horn, actually still normal lateral ventricles, so it really looks like a medial temporal focused neurodegeneration that's going on in this case. And maybe you've caught it at a stage where the uh, global atrophy has not yet hit, and maybe it's more uh, localized to the hippocampus. Another example here is, again, a small hippocampus, expanded temporal horns, and in this case, his lateral ventricles may be a little bit larger than that last case. At least it's out of the range of normal, and there may be other slices that would show this more effectively in terms of the global vacuum. Uh, ex vacuo dilatation of the ventricles. Uh, you see a small hippocampus, a large temporal horn, suggesting that this hippocampus used to be bigger than this, and also you see a large uh, lateral ventricle. So it may be that this is more of a, uh, certainly the hippocampus are affected, but maybe at later stages when uh, there's more global ex, di uh, glo global ex vacuo dilatation due to more global loss of brain tissue. Another case where you might see when you do neuroquant is the hippocampus looks okay, uh, but you see expansion not only of the lateral ventricles, but of course concomitant expansion of the temporal horn because this entire ventricular system might be expanded. So the hippocampus is right there at the mean where it should be uh, in terms of this measurement, and I can see in this case uh, not a lot of thinning in the entorhinal cortex. And, uh, um, and this is an example of a case that might be uh, just more of a global expansion of the ventricular system and not really an ex vacuo dilatation due to hippocampal volume loss. So uh, that's one example that you might see. When, once those ventricles are expanded, 
the temporal horn interpretation uh, becomes a little bit more difficult because it might just be a large temporal horn due to global vacuum, uh, uh, ventricular expansion. So with that, I'll take any questions you have. I'm happy to discuss any of these cases and refer you to some of the um, papers for a more complete uh, discussion of some of the clinical usages here. Uh, but uh, thanks for your attention on it, and uh, looking forward to hearing what your experience is. Thanks a lot.